Okay, we'll go ahead and take on this next caller. Caller, please tell us your name and where you are calling from. Hello. Hi, how are you? What's your name and where are you calling from? Hi, my name is Brianna. Hi, Brianna. Hello. So I had um, a question. Would this be my Facebook so friend, Brianna? Pardon me? Are you on Facebook? Yes. Okay, is this is this the Bruce Brianna? Yep. Ah, see, I knew that voice sounded familiar. It's been a long time since we talked, but thanks for calling in. Okay, go ahead, Brianna. Uh, so um, I just wanted to say, um, you know, how much I've enjoyed your videos, Rabbi Singer. My husband and I both, we enjoy, enjoy them immensely. They're just amazing, and they've helped us out a lot in this journey that we've been on. Um, I wanted to, if that was okay, just give a little bit of background on us. Um, about how we've been going through like a conservative conversion for over a year now, but you know because there's no other synagogues here. We and on the, the the Jewish conversion, you know, we don't agree with the conservative movement, so we're trying to get out of that. And and eventually, we want to um, you know convert Orthodox. And we both have a lot of, as you know, William, you know, especially my husband, we both have a lot of Jewish heritage. Right. right. Um, in my, you know, his grandfather was actually on his mother's side was Jewish. We suspect his, his mom's mom was Jewish, but she won't really say anything, even though she grew up lighting Shabbat candles, etc. Well, our family is Christian, and we've been biting at the bit, you know, trying not to tell them about what we've discovered. <laughs> because, oh, right. you know, according to Jews, Jews aren't supposed to proselytize. So that leads me to my question. Um, since... If Israel is supposed to be the light to the nations, but doesn't proselytize, then how how will the nations know they're in idolatry? You know, someone like our family, how will they know they're in idolatry? And according to Rabbi Singer, he said before their soul is in danger. You know, didn't God send Jonah to Nineveh, a Gentile nation? In reality, I understand why Christians want to convert the world is because they believe that if you're not a Christian, you're going to go to hell, and they have a great commission in Matthew 28. Uh, but it is widely thought that yeah, um, Christianity is okay for non-Jews. Uh, but and it's, That's not correct. Um, but it is the product of 2,000 years of living among Christians, unless you are fortunate enough to live in the Sasanian Empire, the Persian Empire, so then you really didn't have to deal with Christians very much. So the problem was that living in the, in the Christian world meant for a Jew that you're, I mean, with some, with some exceptions, your life was in danger just of being a Jew, just of practicing Judaism, let alone going out and seeking to convert convert others now when we say convert others we don't Jews do not seek to convert people to Judaism because not only doesn't that help them but rather it can create a problem a, a all the righteous of all the nations have a place in the world to come if someone keeps the seven Noahide laws and if you're going, where is that in the Bible? I get that question. It's everywhere. Except people are looking for the words Noahide laws. But if you look at Scripture, you will see commandments that were given long before the Torah was given. Whether it's even eating from a living animal, you'll see that early in Genesis, the prohibition of theft and the prohibition of stealing, and so on. And that's what brought about the flood. So these principles were all widely known and passed down from generation to generation. We want the world to, to observe the seven Noahide laws and to do it because of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, commanded. In fact, this is our central mandate. The prophet Isaiah, blessed memory, says, what is the role of a Jew? The Navi says, I made you. The, your purpose, the, the raison d'etre of the Jewish people, is to be a light to nations. What does that mean? Means to hand out flashlights? No. Look at the word. That you should bring 
my salvation to the end of the world, to the ends of the world. And we see, in fact, as it turns out today, even though what the what do the Jewish people represent in population? What one quarter of one percent of the world's population? Nevertheless, the whole world was deeply affected by the faith of Israel. So, therefore, the Jewish people are are not proselytizing in the sense that we seek to convert people to Judaism because, for many reasons, but we don't have any such commandment, but because a Jew has many more commandments, we don't want to cause non-Jews who are faithful and righteous and keeping the Nochai laws to make them into Jews if they are not ready to observe the 613 commandments. So so that's where I think the misunderstanding lies. Moreover, for 2,000 years, Jewish people living under the, under the heel of the church had to be very, very careful. And in this essence, I, I think that that affected us deeply, not just in the sense that Jews didn't dare um, encourage people to worship one God and not the doctrine of the Trinity because that would mean that whew, God only knows what would happen to you. But I think the behavior of the, of the church and its effort to convert the Jews in such an odious fashion and its message was so pregnant with hate. And I wanted to say this straight away. Most Christians I know, not all, but most, are very ashamed of the behavior of the church, both Catholic and Protestant. They look back at, um, at the rantings of the church fathers, the patristic writings that talk about the Jews, and it's the the copyright is over. Uh, you can look it up online. What they wrote about the Jews would shock you. And the reformers, they were, they were, there were no even okay people. They all detested the Jews. So, um, so I I think that it it became just really ugly to the Jewish people. The whole concept became ugly. So we don't proselytize in the sense of trying to make people Jewish, meaning becoming a part of the nation of Israel, but rather we want to fulfill the mitzvah and, in fact, fulfill the goal, the very mandate of the Jewish people, that the book of Isaiah says, I mean, this is what will happen to Mashiach. When Mashiach comes, look at Isaiah chapter 60, verse 3. This is scripture. This is the word, delicious word of Hashem. And the nations will go by your light. What could be more clear? Arise and shine, for your light is coming. Kings will go by your light. I mean, read Isaiah 16 and fall over. So, the role of the, the Jewish people today is to be an example of how to worship God properly and that we should um, express our faith. But we have to be very careful. You have to... And sometimes... The best way to do that is not to go out and hold crusades and all these stupidities. These things are offensive. But rather, if you teach the ways of Hashem and you do that by your example, it'll have a very big impact on people. So you don't have to go out and do what the church did and do all these, engage in all this craziness, but be thoughtful be, use wisdom, understand, you know, what might be offensive, what might not be offensive, and respond with great care. But the whole, I mean, or else why are we here? What is the purpose of the Jew? The whole function of the Jew is to bring the world to know about the one God of Avram Yitzchak Yaakov. The mistake is that the the what is not understood well is that 
we're not proselytizing, which means we're not trying to make someone who, we're not trying to convert someone who is not Jewish to convert to Judaism. In fact, it is the role of a rabbi to try to dissuade people from doing that. Now, if you're not Jewish, as far as you know, and you want to convert, you're, that's, the, the role of the rabbi's job is none of your business. Your job is to pursue that conversion, if that's what you want to. I'm not telling you it is, but just because the rabbi says to you, what do you want to convert for? Then you have to keep Shabbos, you can't eat in every restaurant you want, and so on. That's his job. He's trying to protect you. He's looking out for you. But on the other hand, the role of the Jew to be a light to the world, that the nations will go by your light, this is clearly in the Jewish scriptures. And in fact, the prophecies that we see in our whole, in the words of our prophets of blessed memory is that when the Mashiach comes, which means in the Messianic age, which means in a time when the world will reach its state of perfection, what does the scripture say? What does the Bible say? What does Tanakh say? What do the prophets of blessed memory say? It says famously, I mean, I'll, I'll quote a verse that everybody knows, tells us that in Zechariah chapter 8, the very last passage, verse 23, and ten Gentiles of different nations will grab the hem of a Jew and say, take us with you, because now we know that God is with you. One mistake people make when they examine passages like this, or Jeremiah 16, verse 17, 18, 19, and where it says, and the Gentiles will come to you and they will say to the Jews, surely you've inherited lies and vanity where there's no truth. How can a man make unto himself gods when they're not? So people look at messianic prophecy mistakenly as this is something that's going to happen. So we're sort of looking at the future. In the future, this will happen. Now, when I say mistakenly, it that's, it's not a mistake to say this will happen. Of course it will happen. Of course the nations of the world will, will express shock and then come to the Jews to learn about God. And incidentally, I say to every Christian, if the Jews are wrong about the Trinity, if they're wrong about these things, why would, why would the nations be coming to the Jews? The Jews should be going to the Christians and going, I, you know, we should have believed in the Trinity and they see in creed and Christmas and all this nonsense. So, I mean, this is very obvious, but I, I want to share this point, which people do not apprehend, and I want you to, uh, to, I want you to take this into the, your innermost part, into the sanctuary of your soul. Zechariah, all of Hashem, of blessed memory, pronounced this oracle 2,500 years ago in the beginning of the Second Temple period to a generation that would not see the Mashiach. Okay? So the question is, what was his audience supposed to do with that information? Zechariah is describing what's going to happen in the future when Mashiach comes. Jeremiah, who lived even, he lived slightly before Zechariah, makes these statements. Je Isaiah lived 2,700 years ago all articulate the same thing. The nations will come to the Jewish people in complete shock. Me, him, and Lishmu, Hussein, Lusrei Hashem, Ami, Niglas, look upon me, him, who would have believed our important look to whom the arm of the Lord has been revealed? All in shock. So the question is, now listen very carefully. Why would the audience of Isaiah... Why would the audience of Jeremiah, why would the audience of Zechariah, why would the audience in the days of Alexander the Great, in the days of uh, Papias, the days of... Why, why would, they, would this be interesting to them? This is a future, 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 like, movie that's going to play out. The answer is listen, and you'll have a complete new, refreshing understanding of Messianic prophecy. When we, the events that occur in the Messianic age are, it, are give us a map for what the world is supposed to look at at all times.
That means that's the ideal. The events that unfold in the Messianic age means the world has reached a state of perfection. Thus, it is always right for ten Gentiles to grab the hirsch, the hem of a shirt, the shirt of a Jew. And when I say hem of a Jew, I don't mean Bernie Madoff, and I don't mean the the this other guy, whatever. I don't even remember all the names. Some guy on Wall Street or whatever it is, or this other Hungarian Jew that that uh, sold, bought and sold Indonesia and can't even enter God knows how many countries. I'm not talking about these guys. You know what I mean. The key is Zechariah is conveying. That means the God of Israel is conveying that this is what people should be doing all the time. They should be going to the Jewish people, those who are the faithful remnant of God. Look at Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 12 through 16. And therefore, this is the role of a Jew. Now the question is, how does a Jew do this? This is an amazing thing. The Torah says, a very interesting language, doesn't say go talk to them. Why does the Torah say, why does the prophet say, go talk to non-Jews, go have a conversation with them? It doesn't say you shouldn't do it. And certainly um, Jonah, a blessed memory, was given a mandate to do that uh, uh, with the people of Nineveh. He was reluctant for reasons that I'm sure you're you're aware of. But um, why don't we have this? commandment to just go to Goyim. Go to them. We should be jumping or running all over China and going all over. And the answer is that just like imagine. Imagine if you're in a room that's completely dark. Imagine that you go into a room and shut all the doors and and shut all the windows. It's pitch black. And then you light one candle. What happens? It's a small candle. But that one candle, the light of that candle, reaches every corner of the room. You hear this? And that one light, that one or, eliminates, it's just a little fire. How big is the fire? It's this small. But that one little light eliminates so much darkness. So I'm going to tell you something, children of the Most High, that I want to say this to you who might my brothers who are Jewish, I want you to know this, that tonight, before you go to sleep, if you say, Shema Yisrael Adinoy Leheinu Adinoy Echad, Hero Israel, the Lord is a God, the Lord is one, you should know that a young lady in Bangkok who's in deep trouble is going to benefit from it. It brings light to the world. That's the role of the Jew. We say in Olenu, the sacking to, to repair Malchus Shakai, the kingdom of God. That's the role of the Jew. We say it every day, three times a day. The role of the Jew is to repair and to bring about the kingdom of God. So, there, Hashem tells us something very interesting. If a Jew performs a mitzvah, as it says in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 3, Kiner mitzvah v'tayra that a mitzvah is a candle and Torah is light, you should know that in some way, which I can't explain to you, the whole world is deeply affected by it. And look around you. The whole world is consumed with the Jewish people, and the whole world knows that there's a seven-day week. Many, many, many members of the world population are in rebellion, it's true, and they despise the Jewish people because they're really in rebellion against God's message. But you should know this, that if you put on tefillin, if you feed the poor tomorrow, if you say the Shema, the creed, the central creed of the Jewish people, you should know there's a young lady right now in, in Vietnam and she is in darkness. She is worshipping idols. It will elevate her. Conversely, the Jew has a tremendous responsibility. And that is, if, God forbid, a Jew sins, if, God forbid, a Jew uh, does not turns away from the Lord, what happens is he brings darkness to where he diminishes from the light. And as such, that's why the Jews are punished so severely. Why do the Jews suffer so much? Why? In fact, and, and I'm not making this up, and it's not actually a historical statement, the 
through the prophet Isaiah, blessed memory tells us in Isaiah chapter 40, it says, Nachmu, Nachmu, Ami, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, declares the Lord. The question is why? Well, on what basis should the Jews be comforted? Listen and be saved. Listen and give Hashem big kisses. Listen. Look at Isaiah 40, verse 2, and literally fall on the floor and 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 submit to Hashem because there is no other who's worthy of worship. The next verse, Isaiah 40, verse 2 says, Why? For Jerusalem, for the for has taken, because you have taken from the Lord double for all your iniquity. Because the Jews suffer twice what they of their sins. By the way, it doesn't say that because Jesus died on the cross and Messiah died on the cross. It says the Jews will be saved because as a result of they were punished double for their iniquity, it will turn everything around. But the question is why? Why did the why did the Jews are punished so severely? More than a now where Jews don't have a monopoly on suffering, don't Think about that for a moment. But in every generation, they rise up against us to destroy us. Not everyone, but there are the nations of the world will rise up against the Jews. If Jew happens to be today in Australia, life is peaceful, but in another country it's not. But the, what the reason why Jews are punished more severely than other nations is that when a Jew sins, not only does it does he sin, not only does he remove himself from God, not only is he rebellion from God, but he has failed at his mandate of Isaiah 49, verse 6, which means that he did not bring Yeshuasi at Aretz, my salvation to the end of the world, and therefore we also cause the non-Jew to sin. And therefore the Jews are punished more. Why? Because when we sin, not only do not only are we held accountable for what we do, but we're causing the world to sin. And, of course, you can figure out from there, the reciprocal is, the corollary is, if a Jew does a mitzvah, today, say, today, say Krishna, today, put charity, put food in the mouth of the hungry, you should know that people around the world will be elevated and the light of God will reach them. Thank you so much for calling in. אדון עולך, אשר מלך, וטרם כל יציר נברא, לעת נעשה בחפצו כל. אזי מלך, אזי מלך, שמו נקרא, ואחרי... Thank you.